old-fashioned phone, ultimately everyone needs to have a smartphone because that will leapfrog the necessity of having laptops or, or uh, desktops in the home. So those are things that I, I think are opportunities and could use a bit more investment. All right. And inevitably, the digital transformational revolution has disrupted a lot of businesses. How various uh, industries operated before has been disrupted. The COVID-19 pandemic came and just, I mean, the effects of the same just came and, you know, leapfrogged it, as we said, because leapfrog seems to be the word of the day for now. Um, for instance, the media. And the ladies and gentlemen here who I work with and are in this industry would tell you how much it has been disrupted. So what do you think are some of the ways that, for instance, industries such as the media, which have been significantly disrupted by tech, can adapt to remain sustainable? Well, I think the media industry, not just in Kenya, but worldwide, is being disrupted by the digital economy. In fact, it happened earlier in many countries of the world than it's happening here. And let me just underscore the importance of the fourth estate, which is the media, to flourishing democracies. I think we saw that in Kenya's most recent election, which by all accounts was the freest, fairest, most trans transparent election in Kenya history. And a lot of that was because of the strength of the media industry here. What I will say is I think because of digital disruption, the media industry in Kenya, and, and Stephen can comment even better than I, is under tremendous financial pressure. Because the old revenue sources of advertising based in print newspapers is being completely upended. And there has been in every country a major, major disruption. Lots of media companies have gone out of business. In the United States, the next generation of 18 to 34 year olds, they don't watch TV anymore. They don't listen to radio anymore. Their entire mechanism for getting their news and information is their smartphone and the apps on those smartphones. In my view, there are two different kinds of innovation and two kinds of um, disruption. In innovation, there's, first of all, there's what I would call evolutionary innovation, which is where things change a bit. You need to make things marginally better. And then there is disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation puts company out of, companies out of business. And what's happening in the media industry is truly disruptive innovation. Everything has to be questioned. Every way that companies do business has to be questioned. And it's super scary if you're an incumbent. It's really hard. In some ways, and this is the benefit of the digital economy, if you don't have a legacy business, it's easier. When I ran eBay, it was way easier to create a marketplace than it was for Walmart, the land-based retail global leader or United States leader had a lot of trouble reacting to someone who had no digital, who had no land-based infrastructure. So I think it's super important that the media really think through how, how are they going to compete in the next five years, forget 10 years or 15 years, how do you make it through the, uh, the transition? And there are media um, enterprises in the United States and Europe who have done that. Paywalls, digital only, lots of different challenges, but, uh, but the media, you're all in a hot spot right now. And it's gonna require really dramatic, transformative thinking. And quite a bit of risk, I think. It, you know, when you have to take one foot off of one rock before you got your foot on the other rock, it's pretty scary. It really is, it really is. And when you talk about the disruption and you've mentioned about how um, it eventually brings to question almost every function of an, of an organization. Now we've seen the, you know, the increased uptake of uh, technology has inevitably caused many jobs to fall redundant. So you find, especially maybe someone has an organization that is a factory, for instance, and we bring in this machine which is full of tech, and if the guy was running a business with a thousand staff, about maybe 400 are now rendered redundant because of this uh, machine or this technology. So how then should we ensure that we are staying you know, in step with the time so that we are also training people enough to take up the new job so that we don't have, we already have a, a burdensome you know, unemployment situation just to avoid that being the case? So I think one of the things that I would be thinking about for Kenya is 
most, country, most countries of the world started as agrarian economies, where, like Kenya today, 70% of the people work in the agriculture sector, then moved to the manufacturing sector, to what we would call industrialization, version 1.0, I suppose, and those are factories, and then began to move to the digital economy. I think that, given where Kenya is, it would be important not to miss that middle step, because not every factory is going to be automated in the next 10 years. Not every factory is going to be run by robotics, particularly in Kenya. And I have been struck by going back to this notion of supply chain diversification. Every apparel company in the world is trying to think, how do we diversify out of maybe Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, to other places in the world? And again, Kenya looks fantastic on those dimensions. Great workforce, English speaking. There's two um, apparel companies who've gone to Ati River in 2020 who now employ 25,000 people in just two years. So I wouldn't try to leap over creating that industrial bedrock of, of factories that can employ lots of people in the near term. It doesn't mean that every business isn't at some level a tech business. It doesn't mean that the K through 12 students in this country shouldn't be well equipped with science, technology, engineering, math, all the basic skills. But I do think there's a real role for bringing lots of um, what I would call factory jobs here. And, and the CS mentioned some of them, building uh, smartphone handsets, building electronics. Those are tech jobs in a way but Kenya is incredibly well suited and they do employ a lot of people. The problem, if there is one with the digital economy, is per dollar of revenue, the big tech companies employ many less people per dollar of revenue than a big manufacturing company. So I just think it has to be balanced here because the youth unemployment challenges are um, a challenge here. And, uh, and I think we just, Kenya should just think about how to balance that between agriculture, factories, if you will, and the digital economy. All right, and <clears throat> when you talk about, I mean, it's a global space, and so how then can, in your view, Kenya position itself to be attractive to investors, especially in the digital economy, um, in terms of be it regulations or otherwise? Um, and is this something that you talk to government about? Yeah, so listen, I think Kenya is a standout on the African continent today. But in terms of um, particularly foreign direct investment, I can tell you as the CEO of, a for of two Fortune 50 American companies, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about Africa. There's always a challenge in the United States, a problem in Europe, an opportunity in Asia. And so I think that Africa in general and Kenya specifically needs to tell its story more effectively um, outside of Africa. And uh, so that's what I would call the narrative. Why Africa, why Kenya? And that could be, a, I think, a very powerful, it sounds quite simple, but a powerful narrative of how do we tell the story of Africa and the story of Kenya outside of the continent. And there's a number of ideas there. Um, every foreign trade mission should be able to say why Africa, why Kenya in just a few minutes. Um, the second, and I mentioned it, is the climate to attract investment and frankly to attract entrepreneurs, Kenyan entrepreneurs, to invest their time and effort in this country. And those are a set of legal regulatory frameworks, some of which the cabinet secretary talked about, um, just to make it, again, the most attractive place in Africa, the most attractive place in the world to invest. And there's probably 10 different um, initiatives that could probably make a pretty big difference here, one of which I mentioned was comporting to the OEC um, two-pillar framework, but there are others as well, um, one of which would be the um, domestic equity rule, which one-third of ICT companies here need to have domestic shareholders. That is a challenge for, um, you know, foreign direct investment. So those are the kinds of things, I think those two, the narrative of why Africa, why Kenya, and making sure that the legal and regulatory and policy framework is as welcoming as can be. So is it that, you know, there are some American country, uh, companies, I should say, that would more easily come and invest in Kenya if there was no requirement for the directorship kind of balance? Yes. All right. So that is... I'm glad the CS is here. 
<laughs> and, and that's a good message to him. And um, as we come to a close, you mentioned about, you know, there's the big companies and the small ones as well. And we, had, we have a mix of those represented here. What would your advice be to the smaller companies? I mean, when, you're on, when we're online, we are in some ways on an equal play field, but in terms of resources, we are not. So those who would want to compete with the big boys and the big girls, what would your advice be to them so that they do not end up, you know, there's the statistic of such a large percentage of small businesses dying out by the time they are five. So what would your guidance be to them on that? Well, first of all, being an entrepreneur and starting companies is the most exciting thing that I think any of you could ever do. It's also risky, right? At least in the United States, nine out of 10 startups fail. So failure is, in Silicon Valley, failure is, failure is not a, a, a badge of dishonor, it's a badge of honor. Um, and what you learn in those failures, you apply to successes later on. But I would say small companies in many ways have big advantages versus the very largest tech companies. And that might be counterintuitive because you say, well, these companies have so many resources and so much money and so many people. But the downside of big companies is they can't move as fast, right? You know, we used to say at, at uh, eBay, grow big while staying small. And that's hard to do. It's so hard to do because as you get big, there's more bureaucracy, there's more decision makers, there's more reasons to say no at a big company. And so think of speed, agility, the ability to pivot quite fast, the ability to test and iterate. If you're a little company and you make a mistake, it's okay. When I was at HP, when HP made a mistake, it was national news. <laughs> so you have a chance to be more innovative and more ability to, to do rapid uh, revisions of your product. And um, so I would just say, you know, figure out a great business opportunity and then test and iterate on that business opportunity. It may be not the first thing you try. It may be number two or number three or number four. But small, nimble companies can often outcompete big companies all day long. You've spoken about, um, you know, failing at times is not necessarily the end of the road. Might you have any personal examples of when you failed and how you picked up and moved on, which I feel would be of great insight to someone who probably is having a struggling business or they have failed X number of times? Yeah. So um, I think almost anyone who is an entrepreneur or has worked you know, in, an, in a career in technology has had a failure or two. And then sometimes we have failures, you know, in other parts of our lives as well. And I'll give you two examples. So many of you may know I ran for governor of California. California, if it was a country, would be the fifth largest country in the world, just the California economy. And uh, so I ran a very public campaign for governor of California, which I lost by 12 points. <laughs> And, um, you know, that is a failure of epic proportions. It's a, fa it's a very public failure as well. And so how do you recover from something like that? You basically have to say, you know what, I did the very best I could. It was not a success. And, you know, you have to sort of, in the proverbial, you know, you got to get back on the horse. If the horse threw you off, you got to get back on that, that horse. So you just have to use tremendous mental fortitude and just say, okay, you know, what am I going to do next? Um, and my next was the CEO of Hewlett Packard. So you never know what's going to come to you. After um, Hewlett Packard, I stepped down and I um, started a, um, a very high quality video company for your mobile phone called Quibi, short for Quick Bytes. And I did this with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who many of you may know is a Hollywood longtime superstar. And so it was the combination of Jeffrey's expertise in content short form movies for your smartphone and my expertise in technology. And um, we launched in the third week of COVID. <laughs> and the idea was this was short form video for your high quality short form video for your mobile phone while you were on the go, commuting, waiting in line at the supermarket, whatever. And of course, no one was on the go, no one was commuting and no one was waiting in any lines. So um, it was a dramatic failure. And again, quite a public failure. But um, we recognized it early, and we decided to shut down the company after just six months and return most of the money to shareholders. But again, a public, you know, public uh, a failure. And so you just have to say, you know what? 
you give it your best shot, you do everything you can, you be smart about it, and then decide you know, what you can do next. And you, know, you never know what opportunities are gonna come your way. And now that we are back on the move, is there a chance that Quib will come back? That, that uh, say again? Considering we are back on the move, now you know the, the restrictions have been lifted and the likes. No, I don't think so, at least not by Jeffrey Katzenberg and myself. I do think that high quality you know, uh, content for your mobile phone will be something, um, but it will be done by someone else, not by us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's appreciate the U.S. Ambassador to Kenya. And it's, it's important to note that she, um, Kenya is hosting the First Lady of the United States uh, tomorrow. And so you can imagine the kind of schedule she has. So just being here is a great sacrifice and a great commitment. Um, she committed months ago. And though this development is more recent, she still chose to be here with us, and so we are very grateful for that. Well, let me say one thing about that. I'm a big believer when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And I committed to you and Stephen, you know, I think in October. And uh, as you say, it's not the most convenient time because the First Lady is arriving tomorrow. But as I said, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And I couldn't be more pleased to be part of this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's appreciate her one more time. And as is expected, um, she will be making, taking her leave um, now because she has to head back to um, Nairobi. <clears throat> um, so we are going to have uh, a photo session.